Last week, we began from that basic equivalence formula. A person sends a text to people in this culture, and that should be equivalent to a translator sending a text to people in that culture, in an ideal world. And we, we looked at things, you know, in the equivalence paradigm, you could consider the audience being different, and therefore the text has to be different. Uh, or uh, the text is the same and you're going to change the audience by educating them. Remember that? You know, it, it wasn't a, a static uh, paradigm at all. It does allow many things to be done. But in translation theory, from about 1984, which is a very significant date in translation theory, people suggested that the equation was inadequate, that something was missing. And they would start to write equations like this. What have I done? I put in a question mark. The question mark just doesn't say, I don't know what goes there. The question mark is to symbolize the purpose. Okay? A person in this culture developed this text for a purpose, or to have a function with respect to these people, and that should equal the same thing on the other side. And that question mark, I'm translating into English as purpose, it was translated into German, you know, these theories were written in German, uh, as skopos, S-K-O-P-O-S, which is actually a Greek term for goal, finality, purpose. Uh, you could develop it in many different ways. Uh, but the group of theories that I'm talking about would tend to use that term skopos, S-K-O-P-O-S, S-K-O-P-O-S, for that question mark and ask questions about that question mark. And the basic theory says, if this is what communication looks like in the source culture with that particular purpose, there is no guarantee at all that the same text used in the target culture will be for the same purpose. In fact, if you think about it, most translated communication is for a different purpose from the one in the source culture. We'll come to examples in a minute. And if the purpose is different, if that question mark is, is radically different, then you're going to have to make quite radical changes to the text. I'll just give you the theory, then we'll look at the examples, okay? This means entering a new paradigm that actually presents itself as a critique of equivalence, if you understand equivalence as concerning the source text. It says, well, equivalence means having the same function, but most translations have a different function. Okay, what? Think of the Bible. The Bible was a text operative somewhere in first century Palestine. For some reason we don't know about. But it's not going to have the same function on some level as it does for contemporary readers in English or Spanish or Korean or Chinese. Now, And it's not going to work the same when it's used in church in a sermon as well as used in a study group. And it's not going to work the same when it's used for children in a picture book or in a film version. And it's not going to work the same if it's a Hollywood version or as when it's a pedagogical religious uh, uh, version. You've got the one source text and it could be used in many, many different ways for many different purposes. What's different? Well, I don't know. Same text could be the same translator, different purposes. So, the theory is here, most translations are for a different purpose. And that equivalence as a paradigm, as a text-based linguistic paradigm, only applies in situations where there's the same function, more or less, and that can happen, but it's a special case. So Skopos theory came in, in 1984, in German. The 
with these two works, so I'll deal with them in a minute. Not saying equivalence is wrong, not saying everything, all other translation theories are rubbish, but saying, well, all the previous translation theories only talk about special cases. The general case is that we have to make quite radical changes to texts because the purposes are generally new. Are you with me? German speakers will be embarrassed by my pronunciation. But, uh, the two works I'm referring to, uh, Katharine Reis, Hans Femer, 1984, Grundlegend einer allgemeinen Translationstheorie, is foundation for a general theory of translation and interpreting. In German, translation these days means both oral and written, okay, as opposed to Übersetzen, which is the just written. Okay? Um, this is a strange theory, uh, a strange book. The, the radically new element belongs, though, to Hans Femer, who uh, picked up and, and said, about halfway through the book, um, the dominant element in a translation, he's talking about something like uh, equation there, the dominant element is not the translator, it's not the text, it's not the audience. The dominant element is the purpose. It's that big question mark. If you fill in that one, the rest follows. And nobody had said that before him. 1984. It's quite an important, radical, challenging thing to say. As he said in, in, the, in the blurb, the back cover blurb to a later book, he said, with that statement, the dominant factor in a translation is the scopus, is the purpose. He had dethroned the source text. Prior to that, the source text was the king in all translation theories. This simple statement, revolutionary, was decapitated, not decapitated. The French cut heads off. The Germans never had a chance to do that. Um, he simply removed him from the throne. Okay. And instead of, of king or queen uh, source text, we have king or queen purpose, scopus. In the same year, remarkably enough, uh, used to hold uh, wrote a book in German, but she was working in Finland, and translatorisches uh, Handel is um, translatory action. Translatory concerns the translator, not the translation as a text. And her uh, theoretical take on this was that instead of looking at the texts that people translate from, we have to look at what translators and interpreters do in the world at their actual actions and how they achieve effects uh, on actual users and how they work alongside area experts, that is, the client or the people who know a lot about the field you're working in become partners in this communication act. For her, the translator interpreter is an expert in cross-cultural communication, working with experts in the various fields concerned. This was quite radically new as well. Suddenly, the text was just not important. Holtz Mentevi said, she gave examples. She said, often it happens, a translator is there, a client comes, shows a text, says, translate this text. The translator reads the text, realizes it's a load of rubbish, or you know, it's just not, not worth translating, or the target culture doesn't have the required knowledge to understand this text. And for Holtz-Mentor, it's quite legitimate for the translator to say, my advice to you, dear client, is let me write a new text. Uh, or go away and get this rewritten, or develop a new text for this new purpose. Or don't translate it, it's not worth translating. I wish I could say that more often to my clients. This is not worth translating. If you're rich enough, you can... Uh, but but if, I had, if I had what's a polite term, if I had the courage to do that more, I would love to say, let me write a new text for you. <laughs> I trust that in your professional lives you'll have wonderful source texts for your entire career. <laughs> but it's not been my case, as you can tell. Okay.
These two works, 1984, constituted a major paradigm shift in the German language and in the way people in Germany were trained to be translators and interpreters, as might be the case for some of you here. Um, it became standard that instead of walking into the class and saying, translate this text, and everybody translates, you come in and say, translate this text for this particular client to have that particular effect. And then translate the same text for this different client to have a different effect. You could translate the same text two or three times in different ways for different purposes. And it's a very interesting activity. There you've got the fundamental proposition. The dominant factor is a purpose. The source text is the throat. The same text can be translated in different ways. And from that, it ensues that all translation procedures or strategies, whatever you want to do with a text or with a client or with your readers, whatever you want to do is legitimate if the purpose is achieved. Who decides what the purpose is? This is a bit difficult. If you go into the different theorists, you'll see different emphases. Uh, Christiana Nort, who has worked in this field, um, tends to be more tends to be closer to the training situation. So she'll believe that you can get the purpose from an analysis of the source text. Whereas Hans Vermeer uh, is more inclined to have was more inclined to have a radical break. Uh, with the previous paradigm, and he insisted that the translator was the one who decided. Others will insist the client is the one who decides. Christiana Nord would also give a lot of weight to uh, what the client says. So, when you translate a text, you don't just have the source text. According to this theory, you must also have... Um, in German, it's Auftrag. Um, I first translated this as brief, like a lawyer gets a brief. Or, you know, your brief is, get me out of here, or defend me, or whatever. And then the lawyer has a lot of scope for action. Uh, Fermer used the term commission, like a painter. You know, I'll commission you to paint a painting big enough to fill that wall, and it must depict the Monterey seascape. Go and do what you can. Okay, that might be a commission. I think these days I would translate it more as instructions. Simply, the instructions from the client. Or a job description. Uh, what the client tells you about the product to be delivered. Okay? Because that's a language that the industry might understand. And in class, I usually do that. I give the text and I give the instructions about how it's to be translated, the function or purpose it has to achieve. I'm sure, you, if you haven't heard about this theory before, I'm sure you're overwhelmed with its radically new nature and appropriateness to actual industrial practices. And I think it was in 1984. It was updating our theories to what was actually happening in the world. But it's not denying everything else that happened previously. This is a map, it's taken from Christiana Nord, of what translatorial action might be, what translators do. Imagine you've got communication. It can be intra- or cross-cultural. If it's we're dealing with cross-cultural here. If it's cross-cultural, it can be mediated or direct. We're dealing with mediated cross-cultural communication. And that's what translatorial action is. It's what people do in mediated cross-cultural communication. Translatorial action, though, can be with a translation or without a translation. That is, translators here can produce translations as they have tended to do, or can be involved in drafting new texts, in rewriting badly written texts, in doing the terminology, increasingly in post-editing machine translation output, as people in my practical class or in TLM, should be aware, or giving advice, providing um, consulting services on cross-cultural communication. 
a lot of activities there that translators are well positioned to do because of the skill sets they tend to have and that we are not really training people for, unfortunately. And then under the translations, the translation could be for a new function or the same function, in which case we return to the traditional equivalence paradigm. I find this quite a stimulating map because it suggests that for centuries we've been doing a lot of work down in this corner without seeing the wider scheme of things. Also, you might get a lot more money doing this sort of thing than that sort of thing. I relate this theory to uh, similar theories developed entirely in parallel, without any connection whatsoever, by Daniel Guadec in France, in, uh, in, uh, in Rennes. Uh, Guadec, now retired, Fermer died two years ago, which really is, once again, a, a change of generations. Um, Guadec's thing was to train translators for industry. He was very radical. He would not have classrooms, for example. He wouldn't have schedules. You'd have groups working on projects, and they had to figure it out for themselves, and they would be real projects for industry, and when you could do that well, you get a job straight away in industry. It was a, it's quite a radical model of training technical translators um, who are from the beginning involved in the work procedures and workflows of, of industry. As you can see here, uh, Guadix's model of translation goes through the things that happen when a big project, we're talking about I don't know, a thousand or so pages, a big project, is received by a company and dealt with. The acquisition, you work out the specifications and you, you see exactly what the, job, uh, what the job is to be done. You accept the job, you go to a pre-transfer phase, you work out your quote, how much you're going to charge, you're going to check how quality is going to be controlled with the client, you fix up the terminology, the phraseology, you get your client's advice on things like what kind of second person you're going to use, the formal or informal, we, we looked at that last week. Okay. You take the packet and, and move the images out of it and get it ready so it can be treated by our translation technology. We draw up the terminology and the phraseology. We decide on these options with the client. The client agrees on all of that. And then, you know what happens? You translate. A transfer is our traditional translation phase. Once you've done that, you check everything's been done, and you review it, and there's the rewriting that's necessary. You certify it, you sign off, you say it's, it's what has to be done, you put it back together, and you deliver it. That, for Guadec, is translation. What's remarkable in this is that the least interesting part is that transfer part, which is the bit that the entire equivalence paradigm was concerned with, and still is concerned with. That, in the real world, um, especially in the localization world, what we're calling localization here, most of the activity, the hard work, is prior to the translation, deciding what you're going to do and for what purpose, getting your strategies right, discussing things with your client, getting what Guadec terms the job specifications. And that job specifications might easily translate scores in an industrial world. Okay, so it's, it's a parallel theory. It seems to be saying something similar because it got out of linguistics and looked at what was happening in the real world. And that's something that I think we, we all should be doing quite a bit of.